Welcome to Good News for Life, presented to you by the International Evangelical Church. As we do each week, we bring you a worship experience using a song, our kids' corner, and a sermon in our series on 2 Corinthians. This week's sermon is going to be by Pastor Nell Motz. Let's begin our worship with this call to worship. Call to worship from Luke 12, Jesus' words to his disciples. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and body more than clothes. But seek first his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well.
some stuff sorted out in my head. Sure. You mean like you have a ponder question? Yes, like that. Oh, I love ponder questions where you have to think and try and figure something out. God loves it when we use our brain. You are so right. He loves that. So I'm going to tell you a story. Yeah, I love your stories. Is it from the Bible? No, it's from today. Good. I'm ready and listening. Got uh, my brain fired. Okay, here we go. There's a man in our church, and some years ago, he was making a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. Money, money all over the place. Whoa, lucky him. I know. Anyway, he had money to buy a fancy house, fancy cars, designer clothes, designer sunglasses. He could go out to eat all the time. And lots of cookies too, I bet. Oh, you have no idea. All the chocolate chip cookies you could ever want. Ah, oh, what a dream. Uh-huh, he was living the dream. But he also loved Jesus and he had learned to listen to God's voice. And one day, God spoke to him. Oh, so let me guess. God told him, I'm going to give you even more money for being such a good, smart man. Nope. No? No. Nothing like that. Oh, wait. I know. God told him to give some of his money back to God like you told me I had to do that one day. Nope. No? <laughs> then I can't guess. You can't guess. God told him, I want you to stop making all that money and work for me. You don't really need all that money. But he was good at making money. Oh, he was very good at making money. And he could have given it some of it away to help the poor or maybe buy me a new dress. Oh, that would be nice. But God's not making sense here. Here's a man that can make money that God could use. Why stop him? Well, apparently God didn't think he needed it. What? And this man believed that? He did. He said, you are right. I don't need all that money. Didn't his wife try to set him straight? Oh, she tried, but he said, no, this is what I want to do. So she said, okay. She said, okay? She did, just like that. How did she do that? I have no idea. All his friends and families told them they were crazy. But they wouldn't listen? Nope, they wouldn't listen. That poor man, how sad he must be. Well, that's just the thing. You see, he's not sad at all. In fact, he's one of the happiest people I know. And so is his wife. What? That's very strange. How much money does he make today? Not much. 
So why is he so happy? Well, that's what we have to ponder about, okay? Okay. You got something? I don't. Do you? No. Hmm. Okay, I've got it. There is a verse in the Bible, and it goes like this. Give, and it shall be given back to you. Your gift will return to you in full measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Whatever measure you give, big or small, will be used to measure what is given back to you. Well, that verse didn't really work for them. You say he isn't making much today. <laughs> Ruthie, what you get isn't always in money or stuff. I don't understand, Miss Terry. Actually, I think what he got was more than money could ever give him. Mm, I still don't get it. Ruthie, you gotta ponder. You just ponder about this, this and you'll get it. We've been going through 2 Corinthians, and it's been a th series of themes that I, I find particularly encouraging. Um, we started off chapter 1, how God pours his, overflows his comfort into our lives when we need it most. And then chapter 2, our triumph in Christ and how we become the aroma of Christ to others. In chapter 3, then, we talked about the competence that we have, not in our ability, but in God's ability to make us ministers of reconciliation um, or make us ministers of the new covenant. In chapter 4, we talked about how God uses clay pots, or as I sometimes think of myself as a crack pot, but how God takes and delights in using us. And then chapter 5, how we become ambassadors of reconciliation. And then last week we talked about his, how we are his temple, his people. And now, now um, and then the week bef um, before, before that, we did chapter 7, which is how God uses um, godly sorrow for our good. So now we are into chapter 8 and 9, and we're going to do chapter 8 today. Um, which is going to talk about the uh, learning how to give generously. Uh, it's the kind of thing that preachers really don't want to preach about because, you know, they you don't want to have the pastor always be asking for money. And so this is the first time I've actually um, preached it here, so you can give me a pass on this. But the... Uh, I was, I was thinking, but you know, I'm, I don't see myself as a very generous person. I'm going to get Elam Seget to preach it. So he agreed to do it, and I said, you know, they need a Abisha view of this. They don't need a Ferengi view of it. And so he agreed, but then he came back after, and he says, well, I don't see myself as very generous. And I said, okay, well, then let's try doing it together. So next week, we're going to do a dialogue sermon where we both contribute to the same theme and message that's there. And, uh, but we, we come with this sense of inadequacy of our own ability to speak to this issue. So we're going to listen to what Paul has to say. We're going to hear what he has to say about the importance of the ministry of reconciliation, or ministry of generosity, sorry. And so let me begin with a brief prayer. Oh Lord, we all have much to learn about generosity. And so I would ask that we would hear your voice, whisper into our, our hearts and our minds. In your name I pray, amen. Let me begin by reading the first nine verses of chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded for us, with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, 
and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I'm wanting to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. So Paul is really addressing this issue of, of um, what was started by having a collection that was, he was appealing to the Corinthians for to help the distressed Christians in Jerusalem at that time. And so they had started, but then they didn't complete it. And so now Paul is talking to them about completing this challenge that they had of helping the the Christians in, in Jerusalem. I guess it'd be kind of like what we've done with the Five Loaves Challenge. We responded to some who were suffering under the COVID crisis in, in our particular area here. And so it's, we were going to give you that challenge again for Christmas time. It's not that we didn't complete it before. We completed what we wanted, but we see the need is still there, so we're going to do it again. Well, Paul is writing to the Corinthians in somewhat the same way of, you know, com complete the task, complete the, what you had promised to do in terms of the, the gift that would help the Christians in Jerusalem. But see, what had happened, there was there some misunderstandings between Paul and, and the Corinthians. And so now he's calling them not just to complete the offering that they had said they would do, but also he's wanting them to learn certain spiritual lessons through this act of giving. So Paul, in, in saying this, he's not saying that money is bad and then he tries to guilt them into giving. He, the Bible is really clear that the money is neither good nor bad. Um, it, it's not money itself. Rather, it's the love of money. And that's what Paul wrote to Timothy. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, he says, for, for the love of money is the root of all evil. In other words, the the desire, the consuming desire to have more and more is what becomes the root of all evil and issues. And so some, he said, have, have in seeking to have more money, have wandered from the faith. In fact, he says, uh, many uh, have pierced themselves with many griefs. And so he replies back to them in Paul's writing to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, but put their hope in God. So he's challenging them to put their hope in God and, in, and to demonstrate it by their, their wanting to be rich in good deeds, their, by their being generous and their being willing to share. And why is he doing this? Because it changes us when we allow God to take and use us and, and and to learn this act of, of giving and grace that he says, it makes us a different person, a better person. So uh, Paul is going to address this. And sometimes Paul will speak to issues directly, which I would say is kind of the North American way of doing something. But in this case, he's going to do it in the African way, indirectly. And he's not going to directly address that, but he's going to tell them about another example. He's going to tell them about the Macedonian church. And he's, and he's going to set the example of what the Macedonians did to help encourage the Corinthians. Now, the Macedonian church was founded on uh, Paul's second missionary journey. And, and so it would be churches like Philippi and and Thessalonica, and um, Berea. And so he is saying that they have this grace of giving that's been demonstrated through them, and so now you take and excel in this grace of giving. So in verse 10, Paul writes, Last year, when you were first 
you were first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. So we're going to take, an, and we're going to take a look at what Paul is saying here to them in terms of just some observations that we make out of the text and then trying to draw some guidelines or principles. We want to be able to see what is the value of practicing generosity. And so the first principle that we're going to come to is, is that generosity, it, it, it's a gift. It's a gift that God gives. You know, it doesn't come naturally to us. We've got to work at it. It needs to be cultivated. And it's not what you have, but what you're willing to do. So in chap chapter 8, verse 12, he says, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So the first principle of giving is this. Be willing to work at it. He begins um, chapter 8 with this. He says, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So he's talking about this grace of giving. But the word grace is a very powerful word. By dictionary, it means a virtue. It could mean a virtue coming from God. It could also mean a disposition to kindness, to courtesy or mercy. And when we talk about somebody being gracious, we're talking about them being full of grace, um, disposed to forgive offenses, impart unmerited blessings. So that's what Paul's going to refer to here in terms of talking about giving. It's, it's a grace of giving. And... Um, the biblical perspective of it is, is that um, we, when we are in a right relationship with God, we are in a right relationship with God, not because of what we do, but because of God's grace that he gives us as a gift. In fact, that's Ephesians 2.8. By, by grace you are saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. So in, in recognizing this, we recognize that, you know, we're not deserving of any of his grace. And yet, God loves us anyway. And, and he does this um, to motivate us to be gracious ourselves. Um, the message of verse 9 is that, For you know of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus was the richest that ever existed in creation. Um, and yet he left his riches of heaven and became poor, the very poorest. So that by his riches we might, uh, by his poverty we might become rich. So when we become overwhelmed with this act of what he has done for us, we want to show it to others. You know, we're not born full of grace. We're saved by grace. And we need to excel in this um, grace of giving. So as you see in verses 6 and 7, 8, um, he says, So we urge Titus to bring to completion this act of grace. 7, since you excel in everything else, faith and love and knowledge and those things, he says, excel in the grace of giving. Or verse 8, test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So in summary, what he's saying is, is that we need to be overwhelmed with God's grace so that we would show his grace to others. You know, you don't need a lot of money to be able to do that. The second principle is, is one, you start no matter what your financial position might be. Again, verse 2, out of their severe trials, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, it welled up into rich generation. In other words, it is not the amount of money, it's the willingness. Verse 12, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So we think of, we think tithing or generous giving is, is only for those who've got lots of money. But it's not. It's for all of us, no matter what we might have. 
And, and a great picture of this was when Jesus was in the temple, and he was sitting alongside where the treasury was, um, the temple treasury was collected. Uh, it was, the temple treasury was in the uh, court of the women, so that men or women could go into that area. And, and so they're in the court of the women, by alongside where the treasury is collected by, from the people. And verse 31 says, Many rich people threw in large amounts of money, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor woman has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. See, in the temple treasury, there were these 13 trumpet-shaped receptacles. And when they put their money into it, the kind of rattles around in there, and it was kind of, in a way, uh, heralds this, the gift that is being made. So when a rich person comes along and puts in lots of coins and lots of uh, money into the, um, these, these receptacles, trumpet-like receptacles, you know, it would make lots of noise, and people would... Oh, that was great. That was really generous. And then this poor widow comes along, and she puts in two small coins. It says, there was a designation of the very smallest coin that was known in Palestine. And these two little small coins would hardly, hardly make a sound. And then Jesus would say, but she gave more than all the others. She, it was not the size of the gift. It was her willingness to give. And, and so what it cost her was a lot more than what it cost some of those who had great wealth. I know sometimes we sing that song about take my life and let it be, and it's a great hymn. And then we sing, take my silver and a, my gold, not a mite would I withhold. And I have to ask, you know, did I mean it? Do we mean it when we sing it? Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. And so we come back to the challenge of it's not how much you give, it's your willingness to give. And the Bible does teach giving. It does teach tithing, for example. Uh, I'm not clear in terms of how much we should be tithing. In the Old Testament, it was pictured as one-tenth. So you brought a tenth of your crops and that was your gift. Or if you couldn't bring your crops, then you brought some money. But in the levels of giving, there was tithing that was just expected under the Old Covenant. And then there were offerings that each man, um, as his heart prompts him to give, would bring an offering. And that was from Exodus 25. But now Paul's talking about generous giving. Now, something that goes beyond tithing and offering, but just being generous. And so he would say, out of their overflowing joy and extreme poverty, it welled up in rich generosity. Now, I think tithing is important. Uh, I don't know how much it should be for you. For some who are not giving at all, maybe 5%. You're thinking, well, how am I going to do 5%? I, can, I can't even pay for my bills. So I can't even pay for the food or my rent or whatever it is. But I would challenge you to test God in this. Take 5%. And as you set aside the money for your rent and your food, set aside your tithe. For some, you could do a lot more. Uh, for some of us, we can get to 15% or even more than that. Uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote um, in that letter, he says, on the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside money in keeping with his income. So he doesn't specify the amount, but he just says, and what's your ability to give? Decide what that is and set it aside. Make it your first priority. Don't make it the last to see if you've got enough money left over at the end of the month. Decide and set it apart. And so um, we set aside our tithe, and we have the reminder of Malachi 3.8, where he where God is, is accusing Israel of saying, but you've robbed God. You've robbed God of the tithes and your offerings that you've withheld from him. 
And then he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now, this is something which is important for our lives. It's also important for teaching our children. If your children get some kind of allowance, if you give them some kind of work that they can earn some money, also teach them what it is to give. Set aside and decide how much it is. Maybe 5%, maybe it's more. But something there which they put into practice this aspect of even out of my not having enough money, can I give? Can I trust God and to what um, he can provide? So it's the act of giving, not the amount of giving that's important to God. But the third principle is, is exercise faith giving. Now, I remember years ago, we used to do a lot of, of challenges of faith giving. Of, you know, faith giving was, is, I don't know where this money's going to come from, but I'm going to trust God for it. And so, um, as, we, as we just read, that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. In other words, they were practicing faith giving. Like, we're going to give what we're able no, we're going to give just a little bit more. We're going to trust God to do something that only God can do. And so um, when, we, when God said, you know, it's the act of giving, not the amount of giving, uh, how did that make you feel? Did that make you feel like, oh, boy, now I don't have to worry about how much. I can just figure out how little I can give? Or did it make you feel like, well, how much could I trust God in this? Can I put my faith in God to a test? And so a faith promise is going to take and it's going to stretch you. It's going to push you in terms of your faith and your ability to trust God. I remember when I was in seminary and um, we were fairly newly married. And um, in that time we, we, we were struggling. I, I had tuition bills I had to pay. Um, I was working two part-time jobs. Terry was working a full-time job. But we did not have enough to pay our bills. Well, we were part of a church that was um, a new church. It had been going for a couple of years. It was growing. There were exciting things happening in the church. And we needed to have our own facility. So the challenge came to the whole congregation for faith giving. You know, to be part of something which we would see God take and do in giving us our own facilities. Well, I look back on those times, and those were some of the happiest church times that I can remember, because we made our faith promise. And we didn't know where it was going to come from, but we believed that God was going to provide. And, and uh, just saying, you know, trusting God for your giving does not make it a burdensome thing. It can make it a happy thing. And so for us, it really was. It, was. it was a time of joy. First of all, that we were entering in with the whole congregation and doing something of trusting God. And then also um, just to see God, how God provided. And, and he did. He, it, was, it was amazing. Um, the, the seminary offered me a scholarship that I didn't even know um, was coming. Uh, I got some extra jobs, earned some extra money. Terry got a raise. And, you know, what we saw happen was God stepped into the impossible and made it possible. We're living in a time of COVID, and, and as a church, you know, we, it's great being able to see us starting to come back together, but looking at the empty chairs for months and then seeing the income of the church going down and down, and yet we still needed to pay our staff and we needed to do the upkeep and the ministries and, and different kinds of things. Like, that was... That's pretty discouraging. And yet you begin to feel like, well, this is impossible. And then you start talking about, well, we need to invest in our youth ministry. We need to see it build and become strong. And, and, uh, and we need a youth center to do that. And so we've now stepped into a project, which up on that hill there, we're going to build a youth center. And already we're seeing God bless. The, the, the youth gathered last week for, uh, last Saturday for an event, and there was over 70 of them there. And Thrive is 
the same kind of thing that's happening with them. And so we see the need for something like this. And yet it really sounds kind of stupid to, to uh, take on a project when giving overall has been down. And then you're going to take on more. But, you know, God's already starting to provide. And there's still more to be done. But, you know, when we are, as a congregation, are willing to step into things and, and see this is an opportunity in which we can practice faith giving. And so my um, principle for this one is that in exercising faith giving, you're exercising your willingness to test what God can supply, how he can supply your need. Kind of like the song that we were singing. Who would expect God could part the waters? Who expected he could close the lion's mouth? You know, but that's what God's famous for. He's famous for saying, is anything too hard for God? Oh yeah, but that's for somebody else. That's not for me. Yeah, but maybe it is for you. Maybe it's for you in terms of God challenging you what he wants to do through your, your giving and your, your believing him. But there's another principle here. And the fourth one is, is that see it as an expression of fellowship. Uh, when Paul begins what we read as chapter 8, he says, he says, but now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonians. And, and he's appealing to them. He's wanting to motivate them by saying, you know, you're my brothers and my sisters. You're part of the family of God. You need to be caring for each other. And so the Macedonians, even though they were poor and they had severe trials in there, they're caring for the needy in Jerusalem. And so he appeals to them based on their being part of God's family together, that, that they should be doing the same thing too. So verse 4 is going to say, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And then when we get down to verse 14, he's talking about that it's because of their desire to help other churches. In other words, they saw themselves in, in, in this family of God. And this was just an expression of their fellowship of being able to help them. In that uh, verse 14, he, uh, he also uses a phrase that's a little bothersome. He's talking about being part of this family, and then he talks about that there may be equality. And he says that twice. And so maybe some red flags go up and say, oh, what's happening here? Is, is the Christian ideal Marxism where everybody becomes equal? Well, you've lived through the derg. I lived through some time in Bolivia where Marxism was was giving that kind of message. Everybody's going to be equal. Everybody's going to have the same kind of houses and whatever. The only problem was, is in Marxism, um, the leaders are um, not, uh, um, what am I trying to say, that the, um, equality is, is probably more like, I'm more equal than you, so I get more privileges than you. But you know, that's not what Paul is referring to here. Um, Paul is actually using something of a uh, the sense of that uh, that all all may um, um, that there can be equality among them. Uh, I think first of all, I would probably call it a, a Philippians two principle of leadership that you are looking out for the interests of others. But behind it is actually uh, something of what was happening in Exodus. When they were wandering out in the desert, Exodus 15 would talk about how they were to gather manna daily and, and gather what was needed, but that some of them would gather more so that they could share it with those who were weak or who were aged and couldn't gather. And so that's what I think is behind what Paul is saying, that there may be equality. In other words, there's equality in the fellowship of his, his people, in, in his church by willingness to share, to look out for the interests of others and to care for them. Now, I think there are, this is a very difficult topic in Ethiopia because there's so much poverty. There's so many begging and, and things going on here. And, and next week, we'll talk a little bit about biblical boundaries 
And so there are, I think, some biblical boundaries to this. But what I want you to hear for now is this, that when Paul is talking about that there may be equality, he's really talking about looking out for the interests of others, helping one another. And that fellowship of who we are together should motivate our giving. And then the fifth principle is this. It starts with giving yourself to the Lord. That's verse 5. Now, why did we say this last? He says it starts with giving yourself to the Lord. Well, because it's the most important priority. Because without it, everything else falls apart. It becomes just deeds and becomes works and, and, and things that we do to guilt one another. And so what he would say in verse 4, they pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. And they did, did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. And so it begins by giving of yourself. It begins with a devotion of the, to a person rather than a project. Now that person that you give yourself to is the Lord, and then we take on his project, and we become part of it. But if, if giving has a spiritual, is a spiritual barometer of our health, then if we're poor in this realm of giving, the question is, is, well, then how adequately have we given of ourselves to the Lord? Deuteronomy 14, 23 would say, Set aside a tenth of all your fields and your products every year. Eat the tithe in the presence of the Lord your God at the place that he chooses as a dwelling for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. So the pri priority is not the percentage that you give. The priority is, is your commitment and your renewed commitment. And so once we give ourselves first to the Lord, then everything else is going to follow. You know, we can sing, take my life and let it be, because we are willing to express that to him. That's what we want to be. We want to be consecrated to him. We want him to say, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of your love. But then the hymn also reminds us that we can say, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. So it's not how much are you willing to give, but are you willing to give your heart? You know, you start by giving yourself to the Lord, and then the rest will follow. When we were here 15 years ago, Malcolm Hunter was part of the congregation. Some, some might remember him, but... He would work down country and so one time I was talking with him and I said you know I, I, I had a chance to go down to Walaita and, and speak for a conference down there and then they put this blanket out for the offering and when they came up and they put their offering they put in some money and but people put in their watches they put in some rings or jewelry and they put in all kinds of things as a willingness to give and I was just moved by that kind of, of gesture. And he told me about a time that he was at one where he said, um, when it came time for the offering, this man came and he obviously had brand new pants. They were shiny new pants. And he said he, uh, he, take, he went and he took off his pants and he put them in the offering. And uh, he just stood there, hands raised, praising the Lord with his tattered shorts. And, and afterwards, Malcolm went up to him and he says, I don't understand. How could, you, how could you put your pants in the offering? And the man was kind of surprised. Like He says, well, when you give your heart to the Lord, what difference does a pair of pants make? When we come and we realize that God would rather that we would give ourselves to the Lord than get a lot of money. When we as a church are willing to be people who desire to be renewed by him, to be renewed in our commitment to the Lord, renewed in our desire to hear God's word and let it speak into our life, and, and to renewed in our desire to be together, to worship and to sing and to celebrate in the Lord's presence. 
You know, when we come with that kind of desire, you know, if we experience that kind of renewal, then the renewal of our giving will follow. So the question is, where is your heart? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we realize that for all of us, we need to learn the grace of giving. I pray that you would just help us, first of all, to come not with a, an act that would demonstrate what good things we do, but come with a submission to give all of ourselves to you. And we do that. You renew us. You renew us as a congregation. You renew us as the people of God. In your name I pray. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take Let's sing together. Take my feet. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for me. Take my voice and Take my life, take my life, take my life, take my life, I give it once again. We do, we do, take my life, take my life.
Thank you for joining us today. If we can be of any help to you spiritually, please feel free to contact us using our email address at iec at iecinadis.org. You can also find us on our website and social media pages. The IEC Women's Ministry is hosting a ladies high tea. If you're interested to know more about this event, please make sure to call us on 0113713611. Next week, we're going to continue our series on 2 Corinthians with a sermon from Pastor Noel Motz and Alam Sagir Katama. Now, as we leave you, receive this benediction. Receive this benediction from 2 Corinthians 9. May the Lord bless you and enrich you in every way so that on every occasion you can be generous and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And all God's people said, Amen. <music>